as you may have noticed if you've watched uh, any of the previous videos, we're changing things up a little bit. And we're not doing top five videos anymore so much, but we are going to talk about our pros and cons of certain topics that we think are important to the gaming community as a whole. So joining me, as always, we have Danny. Hi, how's it going? And to my right, we have Trevor. Hello. So we like to talk about a game that we've been playing recently. Uh, so Danny, what you playing? I'm playing Infinity War mm -hmm. uh, by USAopoly, and I'm really impressed by it. I got a chance to see it at Gamma, the Gamma Trade Show, and I played it. Now, if you know who I am, you know I know jack about superheroes, or do I even care about the comic universe too much? It, kind of ironic, but I'm starting to come on to it now a little bit because I'm seeing games like Infinity War that holds my interest as a non-comic and non-superhero fan, and the game is phenomenal. Like, it's, it's a solid uh, dice cooperative game, and you really get into the I, I've even gotten really excited about different heroes while playing that game. And I, I never thought I would actually say that, but yeah, no, that's an absolutely solid game. And, Plus, uh, who doesn't want a Thanos that's like that big? Well, I mean, I could care less, honestly. <laughs> and I remember when I first saw that, I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, he's, he's a good guy, right? And they, yeah. everybody kind of silently stared at me for a moment because I don't know what I'm talking Oddly about. Enough, in, in Avengers Infinity War, yeah, he is kind of the good guy. Is he? That's told from his perspective. I still haven't seen the movie, but the game is phenomenal. <laughs> so <laughs> check that out. It's Infinity War by USAopoly. Nice. Yeah, what are you playing? I've been playing a game by Arcane Wonders. Um, it is a an intellectual property that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and that is Ruby Combat Ready. So this was a game that, uh, even though Arcane Wonders has been around for a minute, um, it's also co-produced by Rooster Teeth, the company that makes Ruby. That is R-W-B-Y, Ruby. Um, and uh, it, it takes a cooperative game and kind of makes it where you have to depend on each other. There isn't really a table captain in this type of cooperative game, which many have problem of doing where someone who plays it a lot can tend to kind of run the table. In this one, you are each playing of one of the aforementioned members of Team Ruby, um, and you have your own deck of cards. One of you is going to be in the middle of a duel, fighting whoever the, the big bad is for that scenario, and you're trying to whittle their health down through your attacks while trying to stay alive while they're attacking you back. Meanwhile, there's other threats that are kind of impending doom that the other players are going to try to deal with, as well as having to decide between, well, do I fight this thing now, or do I help you out in order to make sure that you can hit that boss this turn? Because if you take damage from the boss, it actually stops your attack from going off. So you have to kind of counterbalance uh, and juggle what problems you're going to deal with when. And plus, they, uh, they managed to add miniatures through their Kickstarter campaign, and I love me some minis, and I don't need an excuse. You're not my mom, don't judge me. Uh, so yeah, I've been playing Ruby Combat Ready from uh, Arcane Wonders lately. Whoa. So that said, uh, we are going to get into our new topic called I'm Game, where we take uh, a topic that is important to the gaming community and we want to discuss today how convenient that we've both been playing intellectual property games or IP games because we are going to be discussing the pros and cons of that. So I will be taking the pro side of the IP games discussion. And I'll be taking the con side of the IP games. So to kick it right off, um, IP games are good because it's able to interest someone who maybe didn't think they were into board games or maybe didn't think they were uh, into the, the hobby as a whole just because they like the theme. Uh, a perfect example of this is something like uh, Deadpool versus the World the Party Game where it takes the kind of Cards Against Humanity, Apples to apples s kind of party game thing but adds Deadpool on a theme where you get to write in your answers in speech bubbles and try to make the judge laugh. Uh, or games like Marvel Legendary, which is a deck builder. A lot of people look at a deck building game and they think, oh, this must be something like Magic the Gathering. It's, a, it's another magic bug. 
Uh, but it's not because there's so many things that you have to deal with and you get to have superheroes in that thing. It could be something like uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World or, or Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Card Game which is based off the Scott Pilgrim vs. the World uh, movie and comic. Uh, and take a deck builder and totally twist it on its ear where now it's not just about spending resources, it's also about dealing combat damage. But you have two phases to your turn where you can use hard work and diligence to buy things or you can use combat to defeat challenges. So it's really interesting how you can take these themes and put them into a game that maybe you didn't think was up your alley and can totally open you up to this whole world that you never knew existed. See, I, I disagree pretty much. I mean, I, I do agree with the fact that it will bring gamers that like the property into these partic particularly games. But the, the problem I have with it is that it's too easy to manipulate the, the players because of that. For example, like, let's say if you were a fan of Super Mario games. There, you, I'm going to pick on USAopoly because they released two Super Mario games fairly recently. One is the Power Up, or uh, Level Up, and one is the card game. I forget exactly what it's called, like Power Up, I think. Level Up was based on uh, an older game where you're basically kind of blind bluffing your other players by moving the characters up the levels. That game itself was already solid, and then when they made the Super Mario version, I actually really, really enjoy it. However, the Power Up card game, um, it's sold in a little box, that wasn't based off of one as far as I know, um, but that was honestly just a terrible game. I played it a few times, hoping that I would like it because it was Super Mario. And that's honestly the reason I bought it. I was like, hey, it's a Super Mario card game, it's probably really fun. It tricked me into thinking that it was going to be fun. And I was really saddened at the fact that I traded it away as soon as I could because I thought I was getting a good game out of Super Mario. And it's true if you're re-implementing uh, a game like Monopoly, Clue, uh, Chess, you know, it doesn't change the game. It doesn't improve the game necessarily. Like, uh, if you like Golden Girls, well, and you like Monopoly, then great. Golden Girls Monopoly is fantastic for you. But I quit, but it, I don't know if that theme is better enhanced by playing Monopoly with Golden Girls, because I don't think that those are two things that relate to each other, even though I like Monopoly. So. I, I will say I do like that their version of Clue is who ate the last piece of cheesecake. That is pretty uh, fantastic. It's not about murder. Yeah. That, that's pretty hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> At least not until we can get my, my favorite, you know, Angela Lansbury series and then we'll do Clue right. Yeah. Um, well, but you say oddly you can have that idea. Yeah, you can have it. But that's a perfect example though. Like they, they rethemed it to the theme and it worked, but like a lot of like like Harley Davidson Monopoly, that doesn't make sense to me. Like what is Monopoly and Harley Davidson? I guess they Everybody have Everybody gets to be the motorcycle. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that said, that's that's actually that's actually a perfect segue to me. So if uh, if you've watched some of our other videos, maybe we've discussed games like Monopoly, mm -hmm. and uh, you may have heard me say that Monopoly is not a good game, and that's because that's true. However, they did do something with Monopoly with an IP that also happens to be Mario that fixed a lot of the problems, and that is specifically the Mario Kart version of Monopoly. It's Mario Monopoly Gamer Edition Mario Kart it's, or something to that effect. Yeah. I don't remember the exact ordering of all of the subtitles in yeah. there. But you get each of your characters in a plastic colored piece in their cart. They each have special abilities. They each have uh, different uh, things that they can do on their turn. You have different dice you can roll for power-ups like shells that can stop players from moving or take coins from them. And it took Monopoly and basically made it not Monopoly. Plus, it had the addition of also being an expandable game with a little bit of collectability. So you had the base uh, four or five characters that came in the game, but then they also released character packs like Boo or Donkey Kong that you could get their pack and their character ability card and add them right into the game. And then not only could you play with uh, new characters, but you can even add more players into it. So you could take something that, you know, caps at a certain number of players, maybe you have seven in your group and six just doesn't work out. 
and add one extra, have a little bit of fun, and basically play as close as you're going to get to a Mario Kart board game until someone releases something that doesn't have Monopoly in the title. So if a IP like uh, Mario Kart can actually take a terrible game, no offense, and make it good, I think IP kind of speaks for itself in how playable it can make something, even though, yes, there is going to be some shovelware. There are going to be those games like uh, uh, the Oregon Trail card game, which is a terrible game. It's very difficult to win, but it appeals to you on your nostalgia. However, that's just a bad game that they had to put an even worse theme on to try to sell. Yeah. Sometimes the IP, you look at it with rose-colored glasses and you hope that, hey, because it's this thing I like, I'm going to like it. But is it a good game? Sometimes they do right, sometimes they do wrong. And I've seen that in games that aren't IP games. That's true. That, that's a good point because, you know, just because it has an IP doesn't make it a good game or a bad game necessarily. Thankfully, right now, we're in such a great time with games that even if it is an IP, you can apply it to a good game or even make a brand new property with, or a new game with that property and make it really phenomenal. Like Infinity War, that's a perfect example. That wasn't a game prior to Infinity War. It is Infinity War, and it's a good example. Um, I'm going to use an IP that it's one of my favorites. I'm going to use Game of Thrones because I've owned almost every single Game of Thrones board game there is, and and most of which were a poor experience. Like uh, I'll start quickly. Like uh, Risk, Game of Thrones Risk. You know, I, it was just Risk with a Game of Thrones map. But you know, uh, Risk is a fine game. I don't mind that. That that doesn't upset me too bad. There was a there was a small box game um, from Fantasy Flight Games that was by Reiner Knizia, one of my favorite designers, and I was very disappointed. You were basically building a pyramid, and mm -hmm. it, a lot of times you would end in a tie or whoever played last, which is almost often the last player. So you're just sorting cards is what you're doing, and that was a terrible game. Um, but then they started improving, like they rethemed Cosmic Encounter, uh, Fantasy Flight did as well into the Iron Throne. And that's a phenomenal game. That one's fantastic. And that's because it had that good background. I knew it was a Cosmic Encounter version prior to going into it, which is why I got me so much more excited about playing it. But then even like uh, the Game of Thrones board game, which is a super advanced version of Diplomacy, which is already a hard game to play if you're not familiar with games, that, that took it to a whole new level of complexity, and I, didn't, I, I enjoyed it a lot, but nobody would ever play it with me. I think I owned it for four years and played it once. Um, yeah, and so there's a lot of good examples of it. I, I just bought uh, Game of Thrones Catan, because I like Game of Thrones and I like Catan. Whether I will like this, I don't know. I haven't played it yet, so maybe I'll have to do a, have to do a redaction video, depending on whether I like it or not. But that, that's my general problem with... Uh, IP games is because I, whenever I see something with an IP on it, I always fear that it's probably bad from a gamer standpoint. Um, but it, like I said, if you like the games originally, you'll probably like this anyway, but it, it, it can trick some people, I think. See, now, conversely, I think that there's a lot of really good games out there that could actually benefit from having an IP attached to them. And I've got a, a couple of examples. Uh, number one, there was a game by Gamelin Games that came out last year. Tiny, Tiny Epic, Epic Quest. Quest. Yeah. yeah. And everyone who plays it knows what I'm about to talk about. So in the game, you have your item meeples. You are questing through dungeons as quest cards come up. And when you complete that dungeon, you'll get an item like a fairy or a boomerang or a bow or a legendary sword or a legendary shield or a potion or a key and it's the items from the legend of zelda <laughs> that is all it is they took the items from legend of zelda put it into this board game and had we been able to actually get the license to it i could have seen so many different themes instead of the goblins that you're fighting they could have been bokoblins uh, they could have been octorocks you could have put this theme on it and instantly had a bestseller on your hands now the game already sold pretty well However, if you put Legend of Zelda on it, you will get someone into this game simply because they like Legend of Zelda, like you stated earlier, where you can have a game like chess 
Or you could have a game like Monopoly, and all of a sudden someone will buy this game that they weren't originally intending to just because they like the Golden Girls, just because they like Mario, just because they like Game of Thrones. Another game that could benefit from having an IP attached to it. And this one, to me, seemed like a bit of a no-brainer. And that was actually with uh, some of the more cooperative games like Pandemic. I think you could have done a something like a, a 28 Days Later, or a Night of the Living Dead, or even a, uh, a Walking Dead theme yeah. on a Pandemic game, and actually made it that much more fun. Now it's not just random color cubes that are spreading throughout the world that everyone inherently names one the zombie outbreak because it's pandemic and of course the zombie outbreak is one of the diseases. Um, and it's always the black cubes, I don't know why. But you could have made that a Walking Dead thing. You could have had the characters, have been characters in the show Walking Dead. Now I personally don't really care for Walking Dead. I haven't even tried to get into it. I watched one episode, wasn't my cup of tea. However, I know that if you could put a theme on Pandemic, you can instantly get someone into a game that they didn't know that they liked until they had a chance to play it. So having an IP put onto an already good game can sometimes help take a good game and make it great. Another perfect example would be the game Quarriers. Uh, that came out many, many years ago. It's since been uh, retooled a little bit and became Dice Masters by uh, WizKids. It's only an IP game, and it's a number of different IPs. They've had Marvel, they've had DC, they've had uh, Yu-Gi-Oh!, they've had uh, Warhammer 40k is the most recent release. And you took a game that was this simple kind of concept of rolling dice and these are characters and you're trying to do combat with things and put an IP on it, and then it became an amazing game that everyone wanted to get it. You know, I think back to, I think it was towards the end of last year, they changed up their format and started releasing these team packs that made it a lot easier to get things. You didn't have to try to search as hard, and now it's gone completely non-collectible and fixed all of the problems with the chase, so now it's even more fun because it's not about, oh, my friend has $2,000 of expendable income that he can put into this game and I have $20. Now we each have level playing field. And it's not necessarily the game itself that makes it fun. It's the idea of I can have Harley Quinn and Spider-Man and a Space Marine and Blue Eyes White Dragon all on the same team together. and feel like you have this kind of Saturday morning cartoon mashup fight going on. I can see that. The only problem is so many IP games, if they're applied to a game that's already in existence, is applied to games that used to be just generally unpopular games. Like, I mean, like Monopoly and Clue, like they didn't change enough to the theme that did it. Now, I will, I, I've been ragging on USAopoly a bit on this, and, but I want to make we up for that because I will, from the other side of it, the, a good game can lead you into an IP that you end up enjoying. And I have two great examples of that. Um, I love Castle Panic, and USAopoly brought a Star Trek Panic. So I agreed to do some demos, and I, I showed how to play it. And I figured, well, you know, while I'm here, I might as well check out a couple episodes. So that way I understand a little bit about it. Ever since I watched the entire original series and all of the movies, and I love Star Trek now. And I never would have done that. And the other example is Firefly, the board game. I played the Firefly board game long before I knew anything about the IP. And I played it, and I was like, this is a nifty game. I'm going to get into this a bit. And I played it more and more, and I was like, well, let's check out what this Firefly thing is. And let's see if it's any good. And ever since, I became a Firefly fan. The only problem is, if you're playing a game, it's like, well, I'm going to play, I'm going to play this version of Monopoly. I don't think that does the IP justice, even if it is a good IP. But I guess it depends on the quality of the game that you're playing and whether that leads you into it. So 
Uh, that's been our points, and we are interested in hearing your points as well. So whichever platform you're watching this on, probably YouTube or Facebook, please, please, first off, subscribe, hit the bell, subscribe to our channel, check out our other videos, and then come on into the conversation with us. We want to hear your points as well. If there's something that we neglected to say, whether by choice or not, or just not saying it, we don't want to run too long, but we want to hear what your guys' thoughts are on IP games. Have you had good experiences? Have you had bad experiences? And was it the game itself? Was it the IP? We want to know what you guys think. Or even mediocre experiences. And hey, we're not just in video. You can also listen to this in audio format on anywhere that you find your favorite podcasts. You can even go and let us know on your favorite podcast site. What is it that you think that maybe we left out? Maybe you want to expound on some ideas. Maybe you think that Monopoly is bad no matter what theme you put on it. But until the next time, I've been Trevor. And I've been Danny. And we will see you when it's time to talk some more tabletop. Get nerdy with me. Tell me what game that you get on. Is it card or eve? What kind of class do you play, girl? In an RPG.